Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have to thank uh, Sully for giving us a warm welcome when we came here, and of course, Benito for inviting us back to his conferences. Uh, my wife and I come from the United States with 200 years of history, and we're standing in an area that has history dating back to 200 BC. So it, it's, it's really an honor to be here. It's a pleasure. The sites are amazing, the history is unbelievable, the Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the sites, the cistern, Ephesus, Blue Mosque, and of course the Grand Bazaar, we will not miss that. But it's an honor to be here, and I can assure you that um, my wife and I will be coming back uh, to learn more about this beautiful country. <clears throat> but what we're gonna talk about today are exosomes. I mean, exosomes are the hottest topic in medicine in the United States. It's in every single subspecialty in the country, and everybody wants to be a part of it. Um, So basically, the exosomes that we utilize are derived from 100% MSCs. If you're familiar with the, a typical cord blood product or Wharton's jelly product or that sort of thing, in cord blood you have maybe 90% white blood cells, 1 to 3% mesenchymal stem cells, and the rest are fibroblasts and some other things. <clears throat> Approximately 14 years ago, our chief scientific officer began to develop a product that was made of 100% MSCs. All the other components were removed. It took 14 years to create that 100% MSC product, and from that we created the exosomes. We have currently five clinical trials in the United States going on utilizing that pure MSC product. One is for polymyositis, dermatomyositis, auto, autoimmune disorder, incredibly successful. We're excited to begin to get ready to join phase three clinical trials for that, because that will be powerful. If we can get an approval for autoimmune disease, think of the other 126 autoimmune diseases that we know about. It can be very powerful. <clears throat> there are additional clinical trials that we're working towards. Chronic kidney disease, is a big one, utilizing both stem cell and exosomes, because the problem with utilizing a, a stem cell product, a cell-based product, on a relatively sick individual is the potential for the antigenic response and the potential problems associated with that. So an exosome product is perfect because we don't have to worry about getting the antigenic response. It took two additional years after those 14 years of research actually to create the exosome product, and that's a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. It's currently in submission phase for two clinical trials in the United States, including chronic fatigue syndrome, which <laughs> up until five years ago was kind of a trash can term, but somebody has decided that it has validity. Uh, our clinical trials currently with the cells are polymyositis, dermatomyositis, COVID, which makes sense, heart failure, um, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which interestingly enough is a double protocol of injecting the hamstrings and intravenous application, and it's incredibly, it's being incredibly successful, which it's kind of hard to understand because we're talking about a genetic problem here, but, but it's working very well. One of the things that the exosomes are in potential clinical trials for is long COVID, because we see a lot of people struggling with the after effects of COVID. 
what they are proposing is not intravenous or anything like that. It's going to be nebulized because they're seeing that the effects of the nebulization of the exosomes, and we'll get into in a little bit why that works. So they're currently in that. These exosomes have been Western blot tested for protein quality to make sure that during the processing of exosomes, right, the way you get exosomes is you have your cells, and then the cells put them in a little bit of a tough situation, put them under stress, and they secrete exosomes. Problem is, people tend to use reagents when they do that stuff, and it damages the protein. So they did testing on it, Western blot testing, and found the protein was exactly the same thing in the pre-product as in the post-product. Uh, they did ELISA testing for the quantities of protein. One thing we certainly know, and we'll talk about this more, is that if you don't have enough protein, you're not gonna get to where you wanna go. Uh, you put $5 of gas in your Lamborghini and think you're gonna head to London, it's not gonna happen. You're not gonna make it. And also it was nanocyte tested uh, for quantities of exosomes. <coughs> so mesenchymal stem cells, we're just gonna review them briefly before we get into it. Obviously everybody knows obtained from bone marrow, fat, teeth, and in perinatal or post birthing tissues. Very stringent laws in the United States of not using aborted fetal tissue. The uh, screening criteria is incredibly strict. Um, you can't even have been out of the country for six months prior or had a tattoo in the prior year. So there are incredibly stringent uh, categories for that sort of thing. We know and we use kind of terms like they may help growth and healing. Uh, we can't make positive affirmations because of our FDA. They're, they don't want to hear claims like that until it's proven. So, but all of these things depend on the condition of the cell that we're using, this MSC. And people have talked about that before. The condition of the cell, the donor condition, or the condition of the isolation of that cell. And there also may be some genetic issues. Maybe they've not been guided correctly to secrete out the correct types of proteins. So mesenchymal stem cells are also a very hot subject, and they are probably the most studied cell type today, certainly in the United States. Um, as we know where it's located from, and they're capable of healing, however, not all MSCs are created equal. The function of a stem cell is obviously dependent <coughs> upon the source. Where it's derived from is its potential action. So we have hematopoietic, neural, epithelial, skin, and mesenchymal. Right? Hematopoietics make your red blood cells. So MSCs, mesenchymal stem cells, cannot make red blood cells. However, they can potentially aid in neural repair, and the release of the mitotic growth factors for cell duplication. For years, we were very much caught up into the fact that these stem cells go into your body and they turn into another cell and become another cell. It's not believed to be the fact. You know, it's the release of these beautiful growth factors and cytokines that have mitotic capabilities and anti-inflammatory capabilities that will optimize its location that stimulate healthy cells to undergo mitosis, not the actual changing of a cell. And the, the important part of why the researchers really focused on making a concentrated MSC product is because they basically have the same property, repair, rebuild, and reconstruct damaged tissue. That's what they do. When you're a baby, one out of every 10,000 cells in your body is a mesenchymal stem cell. But by the time you reach skeletal maturity, you only have 10% of that. It's down to one in 100,000. You get to 50, it's like one in 200,000. And when you get to 70, the numbers are stupid, like one in 400,000. That's why when you're watching your kids play, what we call a football, a soccer, but you call it football, and that 10-year-old goes down, and you're like, oh my God, that was a hard hit. And six minutes later, they're playing, right? I walk through a doorway and bump my elbow and I complain for six weeks because we don't have those stem cells anymore. So, I mean, it's incredibly important, you know, where they're from and what they can do. 
So the stem cells themselves not only repair, rebuild, and regenerate, but how a cell function depends on their environment and what they were fed during the replication process. And that's called the conditioned media. I think if you see products in the United States, you will see exosomes with conditioned media because the people are starting to understand what the conditioned media is. If we had a pure vial of exosomes or a pure vial of stem cells, it'd be a clump. There'd be no fluid. The conditioned media is the fluid that they're all suspended in, but the most important part of the conditioned media is it's how the cells survive. So conditioned media is also a very big part uh, of what we're doing. This company spent almost two years creating a perfect diet. I mean, um, if we had that diet, we would look like, what, what, what's his name, uh, Halik Badur, the famous Turkish bodybuilder, right? But no, we, we typically don't take that diet. And what they found out during research was when they were trying to find this perfect condition media diet, they took high fat or high sugar or whatever it was. And what happens when people eat a lot of sugars? They typically get a little heavy, and that's exactly what the cells look like. They were bloated, unhealthy cells. When those cells duplicated, it was incomplete duplication. It wasn't a perfect duplication. So when they worked out and got a perfect, and, and I'll show you the list later on, diet, that's when they found that they could really make a problem, really make a great product. I think the important part with that they realized during their research of creating a perfect diet for perfect conditioned media so that every single product that goes onto the market has the exact same conditioned media is thinking simply to the fact of think of all the mothers that go to the hospital to have babies. Some of them probably have a pretty good diet. Some of them probably actually live a healthy lifestyle. Not all of them. And that's the problem, the revolving door of what we typically see on the products in the market today are that you have a revolving door of the conditioned medias, of the condition of the cells, of the health of the cells. So exosomes, the next small thing. I call it the next small thing because they're small. Uh, they were actually identified in the early 80s. Now people tend to think that you know stem cells are this brand new phenomenon or exosomes are this brand new phenomenon that landed on Mother Earth in the last few years. Well, obviously, they've been in our body since the beginning of time. We just didn't really discover them, so to speak, or identify them until the 80s with the advent of the electron microscope. The electron microscope allowed that they could actually see them and see what was going on. The problem was very limiting. There were just a few in the world and while a million dollars today doesn't seem like a lot of money, that was a lot of money in the 1980s. So you would sometimes wait one, two, three years in order to have your one day, one week, utilizing the electron microscope. What they saw was, was pretty amazing. <coughs> Number one, the reason it was so difficult is because exosomes are nanometers in size. Right? We look at a white blood cell, it's seven or eight microns. Uh, red blood cell, 15 microns. A stem cell, 17 microns. Exosomes are measured in nanometers, a thousand times smaller than a micron, so they couldn't see them. During the first observation, what they did notice was <coughs> inside the cell, they saw these little packets being made. Sometimes the packet will go up to the cell wall, open inward, and the product will come inside. Sometimes it would go to the cell wall, and through invagination, it would be thrown out. They thought, man, these cells are so efficient, they take out their own garbage. They literally called them bags of garbage. Well, we now know, you know, they originally called them secretomes or secretomes. Now everybody, the, the, the word is exosome. But there was really very little progress that was made until the early 2000s when a technology called nanoparticle tracking analysis became available. That's when they realized they could see exactly what was going on. They could look at the components of that little bag, we call it a packet of biocargo, and really determine what was in it. And they realized, wow, this is pretty cool. 
And they realize that, especially when we talk about nucleated cells, I mean, the nucleus is monitoring the environment inside the cell. It is also monitoring the environment outside the cell. And it's creating packets of information. Think, you know, through the day, thousands of times a day, as we undergo through regular metabolic function, our cells fall out of homeostasis. How do they get back? Not by themselves. The nucleus recognizes it, directs the organelle to create the products necessary, pops up to that cell wall, opens internally, and it's balanced. Well, that nucleus is also monitoring the outside environment, the paracrine space, as it were. And it says, okay, you know, cell over here, the neighbor next door has got some problems. They need some help. It will create it, create that exosome, kick it outside the cell, and send it out. So really the exosomes were, are designed at the cellular level to regulate protein synthesis and homeostasis of also the extracellular environment. Now they have identified in exosomes more than 700 different types of proteins. They've identified the growth factors, the immunomodulatory cytokines, and the nucleic acids, microRNA, and messenger RNA. And that's where we're gonna end up really spending some time. So this slide is of the cell. I always use this slide because very simply, it's the most basic form of life. And how does this, the most basic form of life, survive? Communication, right? We communicate with our smartphone, and we text, and we email, and some people actually still write letters, right? The cell communicates through chemical signaling. And this chemical signaling is the exosome. And the content of that exosome is the message. And that's what we're gonna get into, is the message of what's in that exosome, because that's where we get the results that we do. So as I said, thousands of times a day, they do it. Well, these cells also secrete extracellular matrix, right? Collagen, hyaluronic acid, elastin. Hmm. I wonder if it's a coincidence that that's the major components of like dermis. Gosh, it's hard to imagine, right? But they are the 3D matrix of light. Collagen, hyaluronic acid, and elastin. That is how our body survives. So, what is an exosome? I mean, I talked a little bit about a eukaryotic cell, but in reality, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells secrete exosomes. Every cell in our body secretes an exosome in response to the needs around it, whether it's intracellular or it's extracellular. What we're mostly concerned about, obviously, are eukaryotic cells because that's the type of cell types that we're talking about. As I said before, you know that the nucleus is gonna direct the organelle to create what's necessary, and if it's for intracellular use, they call it an endosome, but if it's for extracellular use and it's going outside the wall, it was originally called a secretome, or secretome, but now the big popular word is exosome, you know, to exit. I give a lot of talks to estheticians, and a lot of times I really have to explain that. So I'm glad everybody's going, yeah, 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 we know, we know, we've heard that stuff before. So exosomes themselves are very interesting, and this is really just a representation of it. You can see the nucleus, you can see the endosome, the MVP, MVB, uh, multivesicular body, We'll talk about those in a minute, the lysosomes and all that sort of thing. And that's really just a space filler because I didn't have anything to put there. So now this is a representation of the different functions of what the stem cell does in the secretion of the exosome. So we can look, there is definitely there's direct stimulation by the stem cell through the function of the exosome themselves. You can have transfer receptors to the injured cell, where the receptor mechanisms are going to become activated. You can have direct delivery of the proteins. That's typically through the mRNA process and the microRNA process where we see that. It's in the, in the cell, not the cell wall, but the bilayer lipid membrane of the exosome. And then you can also have transfer of that genetic material. And we'll talk about that in a minute too because that originally brought up some concerns. 
what could happen with the transfer of potentially genetic material. Think of it like this. The MSC, the stem cell in the body, is the queen bee. She's a queen bee of the hive. The exosomes are the worker bees. She just directs the worker bees to go out and do their job. The stem cell is really just, you know, the mother, the queen bee, kind of like at my house. Um, so exosomes, again, we talk about, they serve as a vehicle to transfer bioactive cargoes. More than 700 proteins. Now this next part was actually quite surprising when it came about, and this research just came out a few years ago. Over 200 transcripts of messenger RNA identified for horizontal transfer at MSCs. Nobody thought it was anywhere near that. It was actually quite surprising, and that's just the advancement of technology. We'll probably find more. I just got a text today from our chief scientific officer. I'll tell you later. It was about technology. It was a new technology that changed what we knew about the product itself. MicroRNA. This is a non-coding regulatory. Basically, it turns on and off the messenger RNA. It stimulates it to go and then shuts it down. And then, of course, we have the lipid bilayer. And as we get into what exosomes are, we will talk about that. So exosomes are very specific. Cells from a specific tissue will only react with the specific tissue. Do a biopsy of a kidney, grow those cells, stimulate it, make a bunch of exosomes, inject those exosomes into the body, they're only going to the kidney. However, MSCs derived from umbilical cord tissue are different. They're specifically designed to mediate tissue protection and regeneration. With that being said, not all exosomes are created the same. Exosomes themselves can come from multiple different places in the body. What we see on the market today are exosomes from amniotic fluid. Okay, you've got some growth factors and you have some things in there, but basically the amniotic fluid, uh, prior, right at the time of delivery, is recycled urine. that comes from epithelial cells. I'm not saying it doesn't have positive properties, it does. Or what we see a lot also are exosomes from plants. Beautiful, they got, some, they got some things in them that can give some stimulatory function. The problem is there's not a single study that shows that a plant protein can stimulate a damaged cell to repair itself. They can give you some things that, I mean, it's, it's going to, it's just not as good. So they're not, not every, exosome is created equal. Um, also, we have, you know, obviously from cord blood in multiple different areas. The MSC from a pure product is much more broad-reaching and is really not specific to any tissue or organ. They do have the innate ability to promote anti-apoptotic, which I saw in the first lecture that we're talking about anti-apoptosis. It's really important. We'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Pro-angiogenic, that's obvious. I mean, we were getting into that 15 years ago with wound care. Then we found out maybe there's some other things that, that are a little more important. Antifibrotic activities. Immunomodulatory is probably one of the biggest things that they're, they're really working on right now because you get the biggest bang for your buck really quick. You get a modulation of your immune system fairly rapidly anti-inflammatory, and then of course the myriad of proteins that are created with all this. So exosomes are really, and sometimes they call them an extracellular vesicle. So the extracellular vesicles include apoptotic bodies, microvesicles, and exosomes, and they're defined by size. An apoptotic body is greater than 1,000 nanometers in size. What's an apoptotic body? Well, when cells get old, they get bloated, they're not functioning properly, they go into program cell death or cell suicide, and you get part of those bodies floating around. It's just an apoptotic body, and it's quite large. Microvesicles are 100 nanometers to 1,000 nanometers, and exosomes are the smallest, at 30 to 130. Now, when you look in literature, you are going to see 34 to 128, and 
150 to 140, but basically a good range is basically 3,200 and 130 nanometers in size. So let's talk about inside the exosome and their molecular mechanisms. Exosomes and their soluble proteins and their components are capable of promoting tissue regeneration, suppression of a detrimental immune response, and induce neoangiogenesis in damaged tissue. So the autoimmune um, for the immune response has become very big because when you can actually balance the immune system in an autoimmune disease, and we saw it with stem cell trials early on, it's pretty impressive. The problem is they're going to have to continue that therapy probably for the rest of their lives because they haven't figured out how to completely reverse it. But it does balance the T1, T2 helper cells. They become imbalanced. You see their symptomology go away. Their, all of their blood tests come back to normal. So they do have very powerful effects with the MSCs, and because these come from the MSCs, they have the same, the exact same function as the MSC. So these do have immunomodulatory, immunoregulatory, neoangiogenesis, and apoptotic methods all in themselves. So I just want to go through a few of these, not to you know, put anybody to sleep or you know, just to bore you completely to death, but I think it's good to kind of have an idea of some things that are in there so you can review it a little bit. Or you can look at it some night if you can't go to sleep. So endolamine 2,3-dioxygenase, IDO. This is immune modulation to the limitation of T cell function. You're going, hold on, hold on, we need T cells. They're great because they kill bacteria and all that sort of thing. And, but it also aids in the immune tolerance. So it limits the T cell function because of your massive inflammatory response associated with it. Interleukin-10 is a major anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory cytokine that we see. And the interesting part of down, down uh, regulates MHC class two. So you don't see the antigenic response associated with it. You don't anyway because it's acellular, but these come from the stem cells, which do have cell walls. And that's why you very rarely see the antigenic response in your, in your stem cell products. And you're not going to see, like in a core blood product, if you're 85, 90% white blood cells, because white blood cells are primary, and you don't have an antigenic response to primary cells anyway. Interleukin-1-RA is probably the most interesting, because it inhibits the pro-inflammatory interleukin-1 and interleukin-1-beta. Interleukin-1 and interleukin-1-beta are the most powerful pro-inflammatory component that we see in the body at the sites of injury. If you aspirate around injured tissue, you will find very large amounts of interleukin-1 and interleukin-1-beta. So why does a wound stop healing? And the first speaker hit on it briefly, too. Because we get stuck in the inflammatory phase, right? What are the four stages of you know, wound healing? You got to stop the bleeding. You have a short inflammatory phase. You go into proliferation, and then you recover. All wounds, whether they're internal or external, get stuck in the inflammatory phase. And that inflammatory phase, that pro-inflammatory pro phase, is what causes the problem. So this has a very powerful component called interleukin-1-RA. The beauty of 1-RA is it is actually a direct receptor antagonist. So when you get it into the site, it happens very rapidly. I've seen it with exosome injections a thousand times. Within two or three minutes, people say, oh my God, the pain's gone. Well, one of two things happen. It actually did work, or the patient is crazy. And you never know which one it's going to be, but typically it, it, it works very well. Also, another one, PGE2, prostaglandin E2. I mean, we know the prostaglandins, inflammatories, we use NSAIDs to block them and all that sort of thing. PGE2 is actually an anti-inflammatory, and it works quite well. And then leptin. So I want to also want to give you just a brief touch up on growth factors. Growth factors are probably the primary function for the tissue repair and regeneration. 
like I said, early on, we used to think, oh man, you put stem cells in the body and they multiply, you know, they duplicate every three or four days and after, you know, a few weeks, you have trillions of them in your body and they're turning into more tissue. No, we know that's not the case. What's happening is where it's optimizing the environment around the damaged tissue. And through these growth factors, we have the capability, and these growth factors really tell us a lot about these capabilities. So TIMP1 and 2 is the tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinase. What's metalloproteinase? Metalloproteinase breaks down type 4 collagen. Where do you find type 4 collagen? Basement membrane. The, where we need to have our collagen. So in inflammatory response, in most disease conditions, we see the presence of metalloproteinase. TIMP2, the tissue inhibitor metalloproteinase, directly stops it. So we don't lose the breakdown, we don't lose the integrity of the basement membrane of our structural tissues. The next one, alpha, beta, FGF, fibroblast growth family. Fibroblast growth uh, factor is a very large family of growth factors that have one primary function, and that is to stimulate healthy cells to undergo mitosis. This is probably where most of the action that we see on patients getting better, having new cartilage, having different tissue, having better tissue, is because of the stimulation of the fibroblast growth factor. What they believe happens is when when either the exosomes or the stem cells or whatever is going into the body, number one, it begins to optimize the environment. Right? We get rid of the inflammatory components, start to knock them down a little bit, give this body an opportunity here. Secondly, damaged tissue through the utilization of the proteins and the, and the messenger RNA and the microRNA are able to be made healthy, and healthy tissue is stimulated to do and this is all through the fibroblast growth family. Obviously, VEGF is good because we have neoangiogenesis. Um, people used to ask me all the time, I do an orthopedic conference, and they say, well, what do we need blood vessels for and costochondral cartilage? Well, I don't know the bone under it, <laughs> you know? I mean, vascular is always good, right? Neoangiogenesis, and obviously, completely derived growth factor. What you're gonna see is a lot of these stimulate mitosis. A lot of these growth factors, and those are the ones that I really put on here because that's what I want you to remember is that these are stimulatory growth factors helping your body do exactly what it's designed to do. It's not putting it in some fashion that it can't do. Put in the right environment, we do have the opportunity to, quote, heal and sell. Also, we see transforming growth factor beta cell proliferation, hepatic growth factor beta, mitogenic properties. That is a big theme in all of these. Also, I saw a couple of the doctors earlier talking about regulation of apoptosis, not only in physiological tissue, but also in pathological tissue. It will increase the release of apoptotic enzymes around damaged tissue so that they will go through apoptosis. But the problem when you have inflamed tissue is that the inflammatory components are causing cells to go through apoptosis because those inflammatory cells are toxic to the body, right? You know what happens when you, when you have inflammation in your joint for 20 years? It's a mess and they have to, you know, have to do certain things with it. So apoptosis of both physiological, it will give you the anti-apoptotic enzyme, so an inflammatory condition. When the inflammation is brought down, the anti-apoptotic enzymes will be in there so that that tissue is not unnecessarily put through apoptosis. Also, it prevents cell loss right through the chronic inflammation. These next three proteins are are big and that there are part of the apoptosis. We didn't pay a whole lot of attention to apoptosis not that long ago, but we, when it was realized that not only is it against pathological tissue, but it also aids in physiological tissue, then it did become more important. If, if nothing else comes out of this today, I will tell you this, proteins are the key. 
They're everything. Everybody, when they talk about exosomes, wants to say, how many exosomes do you have in your product? Doesn't matter. Because if you don't have protein, nothing's going to happen. Right? Cellular change does not happen without the presence of protein. So these happen to have a vast array of protein. Collagen, the most abundant in the body, of course, connective tissue, skin, structural, make it dense in its bone, its ligaments, it's all the other stuff. Type 1 and 3 collagen, formed in abundance by exosomes. We've done this in, in, on tests, what they call desk tests, right? Take, we took fibroblasts from a 25-year-old female, dermal fibroblast, and a 53-year-old female put them into culture, added the exosomes to them, stimulated them for eight hours, took them out, washed them off, and put the cells back in, and just watched them. And they exploded. I mean, with collagen, with hyaluronic acid, with the last, we know it's there, and we know it does it. So by having these types of collagen that can be secreted due to the stimulation of your dermal fibroblasts, that's very big news. We know type 1 collagen, we know type 3 collagen, I won't bore you with that stuff. Oh, by the way, there's more proteins. <laughs> Chondroitin sulfate, right? It, excellent for um, compression in your cartilage. It gives you some viscosity. Um, and exon is interesting that it, it stimulates glucocorticoids to decrease inflammation, which is one of the, you don't really expect that a lot of proteins, but that's a big function of it. Tetraspanins are part of the family that are in the wall of the exosome membrane. The wall, it's not a wall. The membrane around an exosome is a bilayer lipid membrane. And where the proteins are stored is in that membrane. You have the tetraspanins, CD9, 63, and 81. <coughs> You have HSP, they're called heat-sensitive proteins, 70 and 90, that deal with cellular stress. What happens when you, when you have an injury and you have inflammation, you have increased heat? What happens in the increased heat? Protein becomes degraded. This actually, heat-sensitive proteins, actually help to protect those proteins in that area. Alex um, is for endosomal traffic, and then, and then uh, clathrin is for intracellular trafficking. Oh, and there's more protein, by the way. High molecular weight hyaluronic acid. This is a biggie. Uh, polysaccharide that can bind up to a thousand times its weight in water. What do you think that does for aesthetics? That's incredibly important for aesthetics. When they utilize exosomes in aesthetic procedures, microneedling, microcurrent, radiofrequency, all that sort of thing, they very rapidly see the diminution of the fine lines and wrinkles because the exosome is so small at between 30 and 130 nanometers and the average skin pore, what, 250 to 500 microns? I mean, it's thousands of times smaller. It gets across. It's smaller than the base, the pores in the basement membrane. So it gets there. But high molecular weight hyaluronic acid is very important. It's also a big component of synovial fluid, which gives it a lot of its viscosity. Um, it's important in articular cartilage. For obvious reasons, it gives it its density, it also gives it strength. Um, it's good for tissue repair and wound healing, which makes sense why uh, the exosomes work so well in tissue repair. It also, this is interesting, it causes a reduction in the deposit of collagen. What we have seen is sometimes you have to be very careful on certain skin types for keloid formation. Right, you, you, you have to be fairly careful. Rarely see that with this because of the, the function of the reduction of the collagen deposition. That also means that we see much less scarring associated after with it. So you have somebody that has an injury and has a scar, and you begin to apply, just topically, we just created a spray with saline, and you see great uh, reduction in this, the type of scar that's formed on the body. And then, of course, in aesthetics, it swells with the water. And as we have to say in the United States, it can aid in the reduction of wrinkles, right? No solid claim. Then we get into nucleic acids. This is where it becomes interesting because we have messenger RNA and microRNA. Now, 
proteins directly cause change to the cell, while the nucleic acids act indirectly in the synthesis and regulation of protein. So there's an interesting fact about RNA. RNA is catalytic, it's not stoichiometric. What's stoichiometry? A plus B equals C. One, two moles of hydrogen plus one mole of oxygen equals water. A and B have been used up, making the third component. It's not that way with messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is catalytic. It can attach to that neighboring cell and stimulate it, and it's not done. It can stimulate and stimulate and stimulate and stimulate for the introduction of protein into the cell. It can move to another cell and continue to stimulate. It's catalytic in nature in that it can be used multiple, multiple times without ever diminishing its properties. And then one day the microRNA says, we're done, and it stops. By the way, nobody understands that part. <laughs> Everybody's like, well, we think that's what it does, but nobody really understands it. I, for me, that was pretty cool to understand the catalytic capabilities of RNA, which will make a little sense a little further down the road. I'm almost done with the way. But it's, there's some information that's very interesting regarding that. So put, let's put it all together. Exosomes are created by virtually every cell in our body. MSC-derived exosomes share the same characteristics as mesenchymal stem cells. They're not cellular. They have a bilayer lipid membrane, and in that membrane, it contains proteins, the tetraspanins, the, uh, all of them. Um, they have immunomodulatory cytokines, tissue-repairing growth factors, and other proteins associated with that. They stimulate the functional change in a cell. Like I said, RNA is catalytic, it's not stoichiometric. This was a study on exosomes showing that they stimulated the actual endothelium of cells. Well, it was kind of interesting because all of a sudden, every urologist wanted to use it for erectile dysfunction. You stimulate the endothelium, you get nitric oxide release, you get vasodilation, you get filling of blood, voila. They are very popular. But so they proved that it, it does cause endothelial stimulation. This was a little bit groundbreaking in that it was their first identification of what they call MIR213P. It's a microRNA, 21st component on the third arm. And what they found conclusively for the first time is they knew that it stimulated angio an uh, angiogenesis. What they did not know is that it stimulated fibroblast function. Because in the past, they'd identified MIR21-5P, which was angiogenesis. But the 3P, being on the third leg instead of the fifth, gave them fibroblast function. Now it explains why we can put this in a spray and just spray it on a wound. And it would very rapidly heal. And aside from this, but kind of similar to another thing that we discovered, was when we send this product out for testing, we send it to a lab in the United States, probably the most powerful reference lab in the United States, it's called Charles Rivers. Send out the product for sterility testing, and about two, three days later they call and said, what antibiotics are you putting with this product? I said none. They said that's really interesting because you have burial bacterial static rings on the cultures. Shows that they're not growing anymore. So no, there's nothing put in it. There's amino acids, there's vitamins, that's it. They went back and re-looked and they found a component called LL37 AMP. It's an antimicrobial peptide LL37. They were like, now we understand why it works with acne. Thank you very much. Because it wasn't that understood before that. The products, you know, what we think we know today, we don't know, Jack. You know, next week we're going to know more, and the following week we're going to know more. But I find it very exciting to find, you know, to see, oh my God, this MIR21 3P, oh, that's LL37 AMP. It's cool what's happening, and it, and it continues to move forward. Yes, my battery is low. It means i got to hurry up.
They're different. We talked about it. But these have also been karyotyped. When they created the MSC line, the pure MSC line, every other division they karyotyped looking for chromosomal change. Because there's a concept, there was a concept 15 years ago that RNA could potentially cause cancers in the human body. So they went ahead and karyotyped and every other passage of cells they karyotyped. tested for the quantities. How do the Boy Scout get off? I knew to follow up. Um, so they did the quality testing also on it. Um, they did, uh, it's also different in the point that they worked hard to make it conditioned media so that the uh, what they found was a perfect condition media created cells that had perfect duplication. And with the great duplication, they were also able to create exosomes that were good and were pristine. So they were, you know, a couple of years on the diet itself. Anything else that I'm missing? Um, what I didn't get to show you, but you can also, all of you can have this is the conditioned media has an entire list of the amino acids and the vitamins associated with it. It's impressive. It took them a long time. They did a lot of studies on testing all these different medias because what they wanted was a conditioned media that produced high amounts of collagen and high amounts of hyaluronic acid. Because if they can have those things, you've got two of the 3D matrix in your body. And they were able to do that. And we have the graphs on there to show how they did that and when they did it and the list of the vitamins associated with that. So it was a project that took uh, 16 years really to put together. We've been utilizing it in the United States for about three to four years. Uh, I mean, seven or eight years ago when I, when I would speak at conferences, I would tell people, watch out for this word exosome because that's going to be the new big thing. It's here. You realize before 2017, there were approximately 4,000 articles and uh, scholarly studies written on exosome. Since 2017, there are now 24,000 additional scholarly articles written on exosomes. It is the next new thing. It's very exciting. Uh, I love stem cells. Still utilize them. I get doctors who call me all the time. Which one should I use? It's kind of dependent. You know, both of them have their positive, and both have, you know, whether maybe not the best in the world. It's just exosomes are fun. In the United States, we have very tight regulatory. I think later today I'm going to give you a little taste of the FDA. You'll leave it.